Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us for this afternoon's webinar. My name is Xavier Biggs. I'm the Monitoring and Evaluation Manager at Jamaica Aid Support for Life and your Vice Chair for the PANCAP Knowledge Management Working Group. I'm pleased to be your moderator this afternoon. So let me extend a warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the Pan-Caribbean Partnership on HIV and AIDS and the PANCAP's Executive Director, Mr. Derek Springer, as well as the PANCAP Knowledge Management Working Group. Thank you so much for, for joining us. There are a few logistics things that we want to, to cover before we go into this afternoon's presentation on understanding and implementing assisted partner notification to increase HIV diagnosis in the Caribbean. The first pointer is that we encourage that you keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation. If you have a question, please feel free to use the chat box, usually to the right of your screen. We will take both presentations, followed by a question and answer session at the very end. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box to this side. During the the webinar, we will be posting a poll, more than likely as we transition from speaker one to speaker two, and we also ask that you participate in that as well. And finally, an evaluation will be posted at the end of the webinar that allows us to hear your feedback on how we can improve the, the webinar experience. Of course, your feedback is invaluable to us. Today, we'll be hearing from two speakers, Cheryl Johnson and Daniel Darrow de Mora. Both are experts in that regard. Let me, take, let me introduce them to you real quick. Cheryl is a technical officer on HIV testing services within the HIV department of the World Health Organization. She is the WHO lead on HIV self-testing and supports multiple implementation research studies and countries who are starting and scaling up self-testing. She led the development of the 2016 WHO Consolidated Guidelines on HIV Self-Testing and Partner Notification, and most recently, the WHO Self-Testing Framework. Our second speaker this afternoon is Daniel Darrow de Mora. He's a Senior Technical Advisor for the Linkages Project, supporting key populations access to HIV services. She provides technical oversight of index testing, including adaptation of partner notification for key populations in countries, including the Dominican Republic. Daniel has been working in HIV and public health for over 20 years. Just before they begin, though, let me use this opportunity to also remind you that the webinar is being recorded and will be shared on PANCAP's website for the benefit of the greater partnership. Cheryl? I think Cheryl needs to mute, unmute her mic. Okay, uh, while we resolve Cheryl's sound issues, I want to remind you that you can follow us or continue to stay engaged with the regional response on social media, Facebook and Twitter, as well as to look out for the PANCAP redesigned website. Cheryl, are you ready? Cheryl, I think we might be hearing you now. Okay, so we seem to be having a bit of technical difficulties with Cheryl. 
just allow me a quick consultation. Dr. Singh? Xavier, I was thinking maybe while we try to sort Cheryl's issue out, why don't we move on to Daniela? Yes, I, that, that's the question. Daniela, are you ready? I am. Can you hear me? Okay. We're hearing you just fine. Awesome. So we'll take Daniel's Great. presentation first. While okay. we resolve whatever challenges we're having with uh, Cheryl. Again, okay. Daniel is the Senior Technical Advisor for the Linkages Project. It's your turn. Great. Thank you so much. And can you see the slides displayed? Yes, we can. Great. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for the honor of being part of this panel and participating in this webinar. We're very excited on behalf of Linkages and FHI 360 to share our lessons learned in this area um, and to work with you all on strengthening partner referral as an option for HIV case finding. So the second slide provides a brief overview for those of you who are not familiar with linkages. This is the first and largest program funded by PEPFAR and specifically USAID to support key populations and HIV programming. We are entering into our fourth year and we work in over 30 countries with a mix of providing technical support, some funding as well through our grantees, as well as capacity building to some of our local partners. And our goal is really to improve services for key populations across the cascade of HIV prevention, testing, and then linkage to care and treatment. So why are we under linkages working in index testing? First and foremost, we were told to do so uh, as part of a global mandate that index testing become a priority strategy to enhance case finding. Um, at one point, there was an expectation that almost one third of new HIV diagnoses would come from index testing. And now that target has um, become different for each country, but there's definitely global consensus that we need to improve case finding, find the hardest to reach, and a very efficient and now evidence-based way of doing so is by testing those who are directly exposed to others living with HIV, either sexual or intravenous drug transmission. And I do have to say, um, not having the benefit of um, our, our expert Cheryl's presentation ahead of time to provide some of the terminology um, and the definitions related to index testing, but it is defined, and I know Cheryl will articulate it better than I, as really focusing on people currently living with HIV and then offering testing to their sexual and intravenous drug sharing partners, as well as biological children, with the understanding that those living with HIV more likely to be proximal to those who are at risk for or infected and not diagnosed with HIV. And it's not a new strategy. It was used for sexually transmitted diseases and other um, diseases as well for many decades. And so its employment under HIV is relatively no, new, but its strategy in public health is not. So we knew that there was a, a need to integrate this into our programming, and we wanted to improve our yields, but reduce the number of tests conducted, so to be more strategic. But we were seeing that countries had some hesitation, both governments in terms of how to adapt their clinical guidelines, but also implementing partners who lacked standardized models and tools for how to employ index testing and specifically how to tailor it for key populations given sensitivities, stigma and concern and a desire to protect key populations. So Linkages employed um, a strategy and I'm just realizing that this might be in the way there. Linkages employed a strategy to think about, rather than test and treat, reversing the curve and starting with those who are living with HIV, ensuring that their well being was taken care of, that they were linked to treatment and healthy, and then voluntarily engaging their leadership 
to find others in their networks who may be at risk for HIV and to bring them in for testing. And so this approach that we're calling treat and test really puts the client living with HIV first because a common concern we've heard in some of our qualitative information gathering among key populations is a fear of exploitation of individuals just to find new cases. And so the notion that individuals living with HIV have to have their needs met first before they are engaged in case finding to be used as a partner rather than exploited. So once through so community-based services, facility-based services, navigation support, we are sure that a client is linked to treatment and in care, we then are seeking two different approaches for engaging that client living with HIV to be part of index testing. The first, which is on the left side, is voluntary partner referral. And this is very much an adaptation of the WHO partner notification model that provides four different options in which a client can share their sexual and drug using contacts and biological children and decide whether or not they want to independently contact those individuals and refer them in for testing, or they want some level of provider engagement. Either the provider can contact that partner and not mention the index client, or there can be dual or cu couples counseling in which the partner is brought in with the client, the index client, and counseled and HIV testing is conducted. So a range of options to meet the client's need, but with some level of provider engagement. On the right side of this diagram, you can see something that we're titling risk network referral. And this basically is expanding the notion beyond partners to any at-risk network members. And for individuals that prefer to use virtual referrals, coupons or online, this provides a broader way of engaging individuals living with HIV or at risk to bring in contacts in their network who may or may not be sexual partners in for HIV testing. So two different approaches, but for the purposes of this webinar, the voluntary partner referral is what we will be discussing because of its use in the Dominican Republic. So I'll skip the evidence slide, but just the understanding is there has been limited research to date among key populations for the efficacy of index testing, but we're seeing new data to suggest that it is indeed both acceptable among key populations and also it is effective at yield and case finding. So in the Dominican Republic, one of our linkages countries, we had the honor to work with the University of North Carolina, who is a, a linkages partner, and one of the local Global Fund principal recipients, IDCP, which is the Dermatological Institute. And they had been working on integrating voluntary partner referral into their programming. And the name voluntary partner referral was purposefully developed because notification suggested some concern among key populations. And they really wanted to emphasize that this is a process not of notification only, but also of referral and linkage, and that the voluntariness of it was critical. It's important to note that in the Dominican Republic, because of the health system, this was implemented in clinical and facility settings by trained counselors, social workers, and psychologists. So this was not a peer-led program. This program began before linkages several years ago when the University of North Carolina was working on a research program for services for female sex workers. And they offered the steady partners of those female sex workers the opportunity to bring in their partners and to receive counseling and HIV testing through trained staff. So again, the only option here of the four that are in the WHO model was the passive referral in which the female sex worker herself would go out, communicate with their steady partner and invite them in for testing. And among the 64 male partners who were indeed successfully referred, a little more than half were found to be living with HIV 27 of those had been diagnosed but were not linked to services, 
and eight were new diagnoses. It's also interesting to see that among those who tested negative or did not have an HIV positive result, about half of them had never been tested or had not been tested recently, suggesting that index testing in this case could be a strategy to link those diagnosed back into care and services, as well as to test those who had not recently tested. Um, the critical elements that we found is that this needs again to be voluntary, not coerced, linked to other services, as I'll talk later about violence prevention, STI, and other services, the counseling capacity of those offering testing through index testing is critical in order to address any concerns. Given the sensitivity of key populations and all those living with HIV, careful management of patient data is critical. And then finally, providing options so that the client can choose which method of referral would work best for their partners. Under linkages, this program was expanded to a current 11 PEPFAR clinics and now new additional sites. And we developed standardized materials through University of North Carolina, including job aids and documentation in order to be able to track and report the success of index testing. So this is a successful example of scale up and standardization of tools and models over several years of programming. This slide provides a snapshot of two quarters of data, and I'll just call your attention to a few specific numbers. You can see that about 78% of individuals who were offered to participate in index testing, and these would be the, the people living with HIV clients, 78% of them agreed to participate. Of those, who accepted and referred partners, we had about a one-to-one -one ratio. So the 386 individuals who finally said, yes, we will work on voluntary partner referral, I will refer my, my partner or my client, they have referred about one person per client. And this is an area for improvement because we'd really like to see a higher ratio so that individuals are referring more partners in for testing. About half of those who were referred came in for testing, and there was a yield of 36%. And although this data is only through March, we can tell you that more recent data is consistent at about a 30, 35% yield. Acceptability has been relatively consistent as well. And you can see the linkage to care is strong, but we're still working on improving treatment initiation. Um, test and start is still in pilot stages in the Dominican Republic, which may contribute to um, a lower initiation rate on treatment. So what have we learned? That among the four different options for partner referral, clients predominantly preferred to they themselves bring their partners in. The, as I mentioned, there was about a 1 to 1.5 ratio of clients bringing in their partners. It required much more sensitization of the community and mobilization of support among our clinical partners than expected. Changing job descriptions, um, clinical guidelines, really enabling full buy-in and administrative and technical support of our partners um, was something I think that was underestimated. So it would be a recommendation to really keep in, in mind this. Um, violence screening and response. We have a robust violence program in the Dominican Republic and that was a critical element is that we were able to identify where violence might be an issue for our index clients and ensure that they did not refer any partners where violence might be an issue, and we actually engaged that index client immediately in a violence response program if they were reporting violence, so the importance of integrating services. And then finally, it was very important that we provided very clear protection and communication to both PLHIV and their partners so that no information was shared between them without consent. Just very quickly, I just wanted to highlight that we are implementing index testing in other countries. Haiti, since this happens to be in the region, is implementing both index testing and EPOA is really an enhanced outreach approach that uses social networks. And you could see it's had a very significant impact on yield among female sex workers and men who have sex with men. And specifically, index case finding has had a higher ratio, about 
a little more than two male partners for each female sex work index client referred, a yield of 32%, and a very strong linkage to treatment for those 23 individuals who were diagnosed under index testing in Haiti. So just to wrap up, and thank you for the opportunity, is we've learned that among the female sex workers who have participated, they are much more likely to refer stable partners than occasional partners or clients. Men who have sex with men do prefer more of a network and anonymous referral program using virtual or physical coupons rather than the clinic-based voluntary partner referral. Having violence programs as part of this is critical and carefully exploring violence among the intake process is important. And then strengthening the communication skills and motivational communication specifically among those who are offering index testing is found to be very, very important. And then finally, index testing is an important case finding strategy, but should be strategically integrated with HIV self-testing and other programs and strategies to improve testing and case finding. So thank you so much for that opportunity to share that information with you. And I look forward to hearing um, Cheryl's presentation and also fielding any questions and responding to any inquiries. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Daniel. A very, very informative presentation indeed. Just before we go to Cheryl, I just want to use this opportunity to, to remind you or share with you that this afternoon's webinar is brought to you through a partnership between the Pan-American Health Organization as well as the Pan-Caribbean Partnership. Sorry. The Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO, and PANCAP. If you look to your screen, there's a quick poll up on screen. Please enter your responses there, and we'll move to Cheryl's presentation. everyone see my screen? Go ahead, Cheryl. Your screen's up. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And apologies for the technical difficulties. And um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I think, follow on from what Danielle's saying from a global perspective and, and outline a little bit around um, the ways in which partner notification can be used um, more broadly uh, and our guidelines. So I just wanted to start a little bit and to thinking about who we're trying to reach and why an approach like assisted partner notification is needed now, possibly um, now more than in um, previous and why there's such a, a focus on it today. So when we look at our progress towards the first 90, we really see that uh, around 75% of people with HIV know their status. That's about 5.7 or 5.7 million people um, that still don't know in order to reach that, that first 90. And when we really look at which, which types of populations we're not reaching, uh, it's a lot of men, key populations, and young people. And that's really speaking globally. And then when we look at uh, where the number of new infections are really coming from, uh, a larger proportion just globally, uh, now more than half of all new infections are among key populations and their partners. And we see that this trend is um, even higher in the Caribbean region. So within uh, just looking at the, the UNAIDS data for, for the region, we do see that we've got a ways to go in terms of testing. So we've, we've scaled up to, um, substantially, but uh, uh, we're still a little bit below the, the global average. And there's um, a lot of people that are still in need of testing. And it's becoming more challenging to identify those positives in a lot of the standard services. So I was just looking at that here when we look across a number of countries that provide data just um, looking at the total number of people with HIV, uh, we still have a significant proportion of uh, PLHIV that are undiagnosed and, and still a significant number of new infections in several countries. 
So to just kind of give you an, a sense of, of the WHO guidelines, you know, within the context of HIV testing services, we really recommend a variety of options uh, to increase access to, to testing, treatment, and prevention for individuals, couples, partners, and families. So the platforms really are the facility-based model, so offering testing in any types of facility. So that could be VCT integrated into a hospital. It could be an inpatient or outpatient clinic, ANC, TV, STI, family planning clinics, uh, community-based. So this is offering HIV testing in the natural setting of the community. So those types of outreach models, uh, workplace, clubs, bars, lots of other um, service delivery models there. And then we have these two uh, additional recommendations that came out in 2016 on assisted partner notification or partner services, as it's often called, assisting individuals with HIV to contact uh, their sexual and drug injecting partners and offering them testing services. And then self-testing as well, which I won't go in too much into this talk, but there is a webinar tomorrow uh, that will be going in more detail on that if you're interested. So I think Danielle touched on this a little bit already, but why partner notification services? Um, it's something that's been used in infectious disease management uh, just universally. So this is something we see in, in STIs and TB, but it has not really been used for HIV uh, up until recently. And we really do think this is a priority because sexual and drug injecting partners of people with HIV have increased probability of being HIV positive. So without partner services, uh, these partners are unaware of their exposure and they can also continue uh, to have, be at risk for transmitting to their partners and potentially even to their, their children if they remain undiagnosed. Um, and so this makes it difficult unless we do this, how will we control the epidemic? So it's just an important uh, service to be delivering and really important to link the partners also to both the prevention and the treatment services. So here I just wanted to kind of show a little bit of how the, the model may go in a variety of settings. So somebody getting HIV testing, you know, we always try to include STI testing where we can. And then if somebody is newly diagnosed with HIV, you would then include partner notification and partner testing, and then the circle would kind of continue. And, and it's also to say that um, for those who are um, with partners that are negative, there could be opportunities to link those folks to PrEP as well. So Danielle talked a lot about, um, or a little bit about the terminology they use in the Dominican Republic and in other regions. And you might hear a lot of different terms when we talk about partner services or partner notification or even index testing. So just a crash course in the different terms. When we talk about partner notification, this is really the, the trained providers. We're focusing on sexual or drug injecting partners. Uh, that are notifying named contacts about the potential exposure and offering testing. It's voluntary. Um, there's passive and active referral options, which I'll detail. And where index testing is often, um, it includes maybe a broader set of approaches. So that's sexual or drug injecting contacts, um, households, uh, and children in some cases. And it's really offering testing to those household contacts who could have been exposed. And there's a variety of ways, but then similarly voluntary and then a passive and active. So this is something in the guidelines. And then just to, to clarify here, as I was noting with that full service package of different testing options, partner notification or partner services can be implemented in community settings or in facility settings. And it's just important to be aware of the terminology. And then as Danielle was talking about in the Dominican Republic, consulting with the community, getting the message right, to say, how should we be messaging or talking about it in our context? What's the best terminology? And that may vary setting to setting. And here I just wanted to again, you know, show you what the pathway might look like. So this is just an example of, of one young woman who uh, engaged in transactional sex, um, who received assisted partner notification from a provider. So that provider elicited the names of the contacts and got the contact information and then went about notifying those, those individuals about their potential exposure and providing them HIV testing. So what you can kind of see here is those in green were the partners that were negative. So then they were referred on for prevention services. And then also those that were then uh, on purple are diagnosed with um, HIV. And so they were then linked uh, to onward treatment and care. So it just kind of gives you that to the left, that, that sense of what the reach or how the actual notification and then that work develops. 
And then you can kind of see the dotted line goes to a network contact tested positive. So this was not a sexual partner within this woman's network. It was um, somebody within her social network. And so they just also show here that when they connected here, they also identified additional positive cases. And so this is something to think about the universe of the different modalities or ways that it may make sense to, to implement. So the evidence is very strong for assisted partner notification. So this is something we talk about as provider or contract referral, and I'll define those terms shortly. And this really was shown in, in the guidelines and in our systematic review to increase the uptake of testing services among partners of people with HIV, and also to increase uh, the proportion of HIV positive people diagnosed, as well as uh, increasing linkage to care among those partners and often with this approach in HIV, there's questions around social harm or other adverse events. Across all the RCTs, there was no uh, report of index or partner notification uh, being associated with, with harm or an adverse event. So any kind of reports around these have been extremely rare and not directly related to the, to the partner services itself. And then here, I'm just wanting to flag up as well uh, that when, we're looking at what makes assisted partner notification preferred or more effective is that what we're seeing here is the time to presentation starts to change. So if you look at the passive referral lines um, or those that received an invitation only with no tracing, you can kind of see there starts to be this discrepancy and it might be most clear in this slide or in, in, in the visual with the chart that has the red and the blue lines. So the invitation only group over time we see that the invitation plus tracing really starts to, to reach more partners and does so much more quickly. And I think this is also another uh, data, this is coming out of a delayed, uh, so that what you're seeing here is an immediate notification arm. So a provider who, after diagnosing someone with HIV, elicited the partners and, and went ahead and contacted them right away. So that's kind of to the left. And then the delayed arm is a six week delay of partner notification. And so when we looked at this trial, it really shows us that the immediate arm of, of doing the notification in, um, right away really did help um, and have a, a bigger effect than delaying or waiting. And so this is something to think about in terms of the implementation models that might work or might be most effective. So with that evidence, we really uh, then recommended the assisted partner notification services. So the act of offering uh, of testing to sexual and drug injecting partners and it's important to say with consent and it's not just a one-time offer. So leaving that open to say it can be happening in a, in a variety of different contexts and it could be something that you follow up with um, and should be encouraged if it's not a right time or place uh, that that can be implemented throughout or as part of just standard care. Uh, and this is just a summary of the, the different guidelines that we have um, and the kind of key things around our recommendation. So to talk about the, the types of assisted partner notification, I just wanted to hone in on um, self-referral. I haven't included here because it's, it's not an assisted partner notification model, but Danielle's given a really good review of, of the way that self-referral can work well. And that's something to say that these are additions to that approach. So the, the contract referral, this is what one might think about as like that delayed um, opportunity or a mixture of the provider and the self-referral model. So here the client and the provider, they enter into kind of an agreement with each other that the, provider, that the patient will notify their partner and bring them in for testing. And they agree that if the partner has not come in, say within seven days or 14 days, then the provider will contact that partner to offer them testing. And so that's just one way to kind of prioritize or utilize the, the self-referral model as well as the assistance from the provider to uh, get more contacts coming back. Uh, and then with provider referral, this is really when we have uh, the provider, like that immediate intervention that I just uh, mentioned a few slides back, that with the consent of the, the client, that they confidentially contact that person's partner directly and, and right away uh, and start that process. And then dual referral is something that it may be something that uh, depending on the context or the population they are interested in, is when the trained provider and the client go together to disclose the status and to offer HIV testing. Now, this is something that I don't see implemented in a lot of settings, but could be applicable depending on where you are. 
So just to say, um, we're, we are always tracking the, the uptake of guidelines and where um, countries and regions are. And we have seen since the guidelines came out in 2016, a substantial increase in a number of countries. However, we still, in terms of all reporting countries, uh, there's still a ways to go. And just in AMRO, we've got, we're about 57% uh, of countries are implementing. Uh, so we definitely would like to be seeing more and, and are really curious to hear from the folks on this webinar about the ways in which we could support introduction of, of this very effective approach. Now, I know that uh, Danielle has kind of touched on some of the data, but I wanted to show a few examples of how things are working. Uh, so this is just broader index testing. So I'm not looking at a key population specific um, data, data here, but this is coming from Japigo that was implementing it, the index partner testing in, in Haiti. And I think if you think about the adult HIV prevalence in the country of 1.9%, and an HIV prevalence level of an MSM of about 18%. Uh, what we really see here is that the, the proportion of, of clients, uh, of partners with people with HIV who were tested, we have almost half were HIV positive, and we've 51% of those were in discoordinate couples. So it's really important they were identified so that we could also implement prevention interventions. Uh, linkages to, to those services is also a really important part of partner services. Now, I think that the low uptake that's reported here, this does often happen for self-referral or for some of the options that of all the partners that you offer testing to or to, to try to reach, you may not reach all. And so I think there are areas for improvement here to think about how the service delivery could be further optimized and, and get better um, implementation or, or feedback on that. And then here, the similarly in, in Tijuana, Mexico, when we're looking at transgender women and, and men who have sex with men, we see a similar trend here, very high positivity, about 32%, which is, is quite good. And again, lower uptake than we'd like to see. But I thought what was really interesting here from this example is that 94% of those taking up uh, partner services, they use the provider referral option. So really showing that in this context, uh, offering the provider referral was really well received and that um, for them, it was actually a decent ratio of return. So for um, only 4.6 index patients were needed to diagnose um, one partner with HIV. And so I think that's, that's not too bad and, and something to really be applauding and saying, okay, taking steps in this direction, ways to optimize probably are still there. Um, but I think a lot of countries and, and programs are still learning and I think, uh, you know, on their way to, to implementing effectively. So I think just to, to kind of talk about that, there are potential challenges. And so things to be aware of or thinking about to optimize or improve um, the uptake, really laws or policies that stigmatize, criminalize, or discriminate against key populations or people with HIV, those can certainly be things that, that deter people from testing, period. So if those are something you're dealing with in your context, uh, it's something to take into consideration or how you might optimize your service delivery considering a restrictive environment and really focus on some of the messaging you might need to do to, to engage with populations that might be hesitant or concerned about something like partner services. And I think the, the identification of partners, often this depends on, on the type of relationship. So some folks, they might want um, to notify long-term partners themselves, but we often see in some of the data that casual partners or other folks they might be comfortable with a provider notifying them. So there may be different models of, of service delivery for the different types of partners that someone has. And locating and notifying partners, it does take time and it does take well-trained providers. So I think it's just something to be aware of. And I know particularly for the non-primary casual partners, this comes up a lot um, with, within key population groups saying, how do we how do we collect all that information, especially if we don't have um, the, the phone number or all the details that we need? So something to be thinking about when you're starting to implement and strategize ways around that. I think there's opportunities in terms of considering potential methods for contacting partners. So there's preferences by population, by age group, again, by partner type, primary or non-primary. So I know face-to-face -face conversations with partners, that something you know within the self-referral model, and then also um, can be really effective in the dual referral as well. But then phone calls, text messages, emails, videos, or internet-based messaging, we're seeing a lot happening in a number of settings and pilot programs where they're trying out ways for the anonymous uh, notification or ways in which they can use social media to offer testing and follow up with these um, different partners. 
So there, there could be lots of different models to think about, but of course, thinking about uh, confidentiality and ensuring privacy is really important if you're going to go for some of those. So just taking that into consideration, you know, should really be prioritized. Um, but I think for highly mobile groups or uh, individuals that might be harder to contact otherwise, these could be really good methods. So, of course, I think it's something to say, you know, it's what we're really talking about here with partner services is confidential and voluntary. So notification it should be made to partners alone and not to, to not with anybody else present. So it's really important to provide that private environment, um, however you're contacting or, or notifying folks. And I think it's important to also say that criminal justice and law enforcement or non-health personnel should not be involved. So when we talk about non-health personnel, it, it could be a lay provider, it could be a community health worker that's doing the partner notification, but it really needs somebody that's trusted and within the existing health system that can be a part of this, not somebody from the outside that may um, not be bound by those, those um, laws and policies around confidentiality. And then, really finding, like um, Danielle was talking about as well, the right language to offer the services and explain partner notification in the context. Uh, this messaging and kind of communication message is so important. And I think often with community groups, if we don't explain what we mean by partner services and how it is um, structured as a voluntary or confidential process, it can lead to a lot of uh, resistance or miscommunications. And, and I think that that that's something we really want to troubleshoot early on so it doesn't become a bigger barrier down the road or you know folks really thinking that you're trying to do something negative when that's really not the case so i think also just remembering that partner notification should be offered periodically so people's situations change so it may be something that's offered immediately after someone's diagnosed and they may not be ready to to tell or talk about partners or talk about um, that type of information. So it's going to vary context to context and, and that's something to take into consideration when you're thinking about this or training your providers and also the readiness to consent to PN or disclose. That may also change. So wanting to disclose to some partners but not all. Um, and I think it's something that uh, having a nuanced discussion is really important. So I just wanted to highlight some examples as well that could be helpful to think about. So they're not in the region, but I do think they're useful tools if you're piloting or thinking about programs. So technology and follow-up are something I think particularly if you're thinking of a partner services program for key populations, it's really relevant. So in Vietnam, for instance, they used a community-led method uh, and they were reaching partners of people with HIV through a, a key populations network of trained providers. And they used social media and gay dating apps for follow-up to promote testing. And one of their lessons learned, you know, as they said, anecdotally for them, they got much better uptake or follow up when their providers or those offering uh, testing were more attractive. So it's something to be thinking about, as well as saying their providers needed to have three to five years experience. And they also reported that it did take multiple offers and follow up and sometimes between two or three months. So something to be thinking about. And they really focused in this program on men who have sex with men uh, within the social media outreach. And that could be a viable option to think about exploring. And then as Danielle kind of mentioned at the end of her talk, HIV self-testing is something that I think folks are really exploring. So here, uh, it might be an option to facilitate the uptake of testing in partners of, of people with HIV. So some early data coming from Malawi where ART patients were given self-test kits to take home to their partners was shown to increase the uptake of um, HIV testing compared to a self-referral model of just providing the family referral slip or a, a self-referral option. So that 79% of those in the self-testing arm, uh, they, they took up testing versus 27% in the standard of care or the, the, the self-referral option uh, took up testing. And so I think that you know, this is still preliminary data, but something that's really exciting to think about how self-testing could also help increase the reach or make implementing uh, partner services more feasible in some contexts and in some population groups. And then lastly, I just wanted to kind of show another example when you're thinking about um, the, the partner services and the assisted model is who's doing the notification can really be important when you're looking at your resources. So here, just coming out of Kenya, they did an analysis to say, well, what if we had you know, our, our health workers doing this and what if we had a task shifting scenario and really that, that task shifting scenario was definitely reduced uh, some of the costs and made it more affordable for the country context. So 
I think lay providers have a lot to offer in terms of extending uh, partner notification uh, and really making it achievable or scalable. And so something to be taking into consideration as well as how can you lose lay provider cadres uh, to, to implement this and also think about the cost effectiveness of the approach. So I know there may be questions or, or other issues and I just wanted to highlight, we do have our WHO guidelines also on app form now. So you can go to the App Store or Google Play, you can have them on your phone or your tablet. And if you have questions on partner notification at all, you can search, uh, save, send things uh, to yourself or to your colleagues. And so that may be something you wanna use as you're starting to plan uh, what you'll be doing next. Additional resources that could also be really helpful, uh, the guidelines, policy briefs, we have a whole slide set uh, and toolkit for partner notification. And, and then we also, through AIDS Free, uh, which is supported uh, with USAID, we have a number of country examples on M&E tools, uh, implementation guides, training manuals, uh, and a variety of support tools for partner notification. So if you're looking for some examples to adapt for your country, it's a great resource of you know, surveying what's out there already so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I just wanna thank everyone uh, who contributed to this from my, my colleagues here at WHO and as well to Shanti who was helping organize this. And um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email or contact me. Okay, thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, excellent presentation. You too, Daniel. Okay, so if you, if you do have a question, please feel free to use the chat box, usually to the right of your screen. There is also now a second poll up on screen. We invite you to participate in that as well. Some very, very interesting points coming out in the discussion. Half of the new infections have come from key populations and their partners. And so that's very, I think, imagine that's very, very important as we start thinking about assisted partner notification. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat box to the right of your screen. Whilst we await your questions. Uh, Xavier, sorry, I think there's a question from Cedria. Cedria, okay, awesome. Could you read that question for me, please, Shanti? Um, okay, so she's saying Brilliant Cups, really great webinar. I have two questions. One, are there special circumstances in small countries slash small communities? And question two, how are providers trained to deal with understandably difficult or intense partner responses? Okay, I see, I see Alexandrina has a, may have a question too as well. Um, we'll take both questions and then we'll allow the, the panelists to respond. Um, I don't see a question from Alexandrina, but I, I would like to ask a question, um, Xavier, yeah. with your permission. Go ahead, um, Shanti. Sure, and maybe a comment before before um, the question to Daniel to say I really like the approach of treat and test. Um, I know we've been hearing about test and treat, but I want to say that I like the treat and test approach because it really um, puts the client first. It, it really speaks the client-centered approach. Um, but I want to ask a question on the um, voluntary partner referral and the, the acceptance um, that you spoke about, Daniel, um, and ask if you can describe what that acceptance process looks like, because when I hear the word acceptance, I seem to think of a consent form being signed and so on and so forth. Um, and if you can talk a little bit about that acceptance process, one. Um, and two, I noticed that you had a 78% um, acceptance for um, voluntary partner referral. And, and I'm wondering if you can share with us uh, what are some of the reasons for the non-acceptance non that you've had. Um, I think it's linked, um, the answer would probably be linked to Cheryl's um, presentation when she spoke about um, some of the potential challenges like laws and policies, identifying partners, um, notifying partners, but I was wondering if there is, if you can share any any specific um, challenges you've encountered in the in the Dominican Republic 
Um, I also had a similar question to Cedrian, uh, because our context in the Caribbean, not only are we small communities, but we're small countries and small programs. Um, and what experience do you have with assisted partner notification and index-based testing in smaller communities? Um, and then my final question is to Cheryl in terms of, of um, one of the slides that you shared, Cheryl, about um, immediate versus um, delayed. Um, and obviously, there were better results with immediate notification. Um, but at the same time, there was a slide where you made note of the fact that this has to be sort of uh, continuous, ongoing. I'm not sure what the terminology that you use, but we need to, as practitioner, to keep asking about partners and how do we get on board with partner notification. So what I wanted from you is, um, what did you mean by immediate in terms of a timeline versus delayed? Um, and as a follow-up to that, um, what would be the recommended um, time period if we're thinking about the immediate uh, partner notification, considering the Caribbean's context? All right, um, Shanta, uh, let me jump in here for a second, please. Forgive me. Um, it sounded quite like quite a bit of questions, and we just want to ensure that we accommodated all of them. Uh, just before that, Chanti, could you just offer the, the group an explanation on how this particular poll on screen works? And then we'll take the questions one by one um, as they've been asked, please. Uh, the poll is open so uh, persons can just vote. Yes, there's a question asking, because it says on a scale of one to five, what is the status of partner notification in your countries? How are we using the scale for this? For, for for this one being very it's not uh not widely used or accepted five being very very strongly supported and used correct okay thank you all right so let's go back to the very very first question which was asked by by cedrian which is are there special considerations in small countries and communities and two how are providers trained to deal with the understandably difficult or intense partner response. Cheryl or Daniel, which of you will take that? I can speak just about the Dominican experience in some other countries, and then of course we'll refer to Cheryl for the global perspective. Um, Go ahead, in, the, in the Dominican Republic, again, this was clinic-based and by trained counselors, psychologists, and social workers. And the reason for that was both the healthcare system and how services are delivered, but also a concern about the capacity required to communicate, to counsel, to identify potential violence, and to guide a client to safely make a decision about whether or not to refer their partners. And that does require a skill set and a level of training. So there is a multi, I guess it's about three day initial training program for voluntary partner referral. And then there are follow up refresher trainings and supportive supervision for the purpose of really enhancing the skill set of the counselors who are facilitating the referral process and making sure that we have referrals because the counselor they themselves might not be skilled in violence mitigation or mental health issues or other issues that might arise in the referral process. And so making sure that there are other trained specialists to whom the counselor can refer the client as necessary is critical. Um, the question that comes up though is how can this be scaled up, especially and, or scaled out at the community level and how can peers be engaged in this if there's a capacity requirement? And so voluntary partner referral in other countries outside of the Dominican Republic have has been administered by trained peer workers, but who do come with a level of experience um, and training in terms of communication and some basic psychological skills. So I think that's just important to mention that there is a res human resource requirement for partner referral, but as Cheryl alluded to and I mentioned actually directly, there are other options for partner referral that can be done electronically, um, through physical coupons that would not require the engagement of a trained provider. Um, Cheryl, I wanted to give you an opportunity to add to that before responding to the question about um, small communities. 
Yeah, no, for sure. So I think what I would maybe say is, you know, agreeing very much with Danielle and, you know, a lot of countries when you're just starting out with partner services, you might have, you know, and I think it's a really good idea to start with like a trained cadre or something that is, you know, starting out. So as Danielle's talking about like social workers or trained psychologists or health workers getting things going. And, and I know a number of countries that start with a model like that, that's with health workers. Uh, and then these health workers become like health advisors of a small team of peers or community workers or those that, you know, had other tasks in the health system that now can be trained uh, to, to do this type of work. And then I think gradually then as you start to, to move forward and scale up the program, you can start to branch out further and further. So I think it's about just phasing the implementation, perhaps, um, and thinking through like, OK, how to get started and you know learning a little bit as you go and then you know moving to something that's sustainable uh, and you know i think that the resource constraints you know both financial and human resources you know will always be an issue that we have to kind of grapple with and i th i think that the the particularly in the key populations community um, and maybe this relates a little bit to the small communities question, there's going to be variability. And so it's important to always be grounded in what the community is telling you um, as an implementer or as the, the ministry, you know, what's really going to work best for them. Uh, and I think you, you also should be prepared to hear, um, you know, when you're talking about this, nobody wants to do this necessarily. Like it's not easy. Uh, it's an uncomfortable discussion with your partner. It's a challenging discussion to have. And whether we, you know, do this or not, that's not going to change. I mean, having zero discordancy, having um, partners who are with HIV and being diagnosed with HIV, those things can be challenging. And, and I think we just we can't just ignore it because it's an, it is an important service. And if our task is to, you know, really achieve epidemic control, it's something we really need to be doing and, and view this as a service for for both the partner uh, and the client and how we can best meet their needs. But I just think it's important to highlight that is when you're thinking about this, it, you may get pushback and, and that should be expected to some degree. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but I'm hoping you could get to at least two of Dr. Singh's question. Number one had to do with the, 20, the remaining 22%, Daniel, that did not take up uh, volunteer partner referrals, what were the factors associated with the, um, the refusal? So it's an excellent question. And I think it um, goes back to what Cheryl articulated very well, is that this is a very personal decision. Somebody who is recently diagnosed is digesting and managing their own response to their own diagnosis. And so if partner referral is offered at the point of diagnosis, it, there may be a refusal solely for the reason that that client is not yet ready to think about referring partners. They really need to focus on themselves. And so I think Cheryl rightly pointed out that partner referrals should be safely and carefully offered at multiple points, even introduced at pre-counseling. And I think the community plays an important role to sensitize key populations and people living with HIV that this service exists, it's safe, and can be considered so that when a client is offered it, it's not the first time they're hearing it and they are aware about it. Um, so I think one of the reasons for a, re a refusal to participate would be that the client is not ready. Another reason would be that the client does not feel comfortable either directly or with the assistance of a provider um, engaging their partner in testing. The client may not have information about the partner. They may, there's multiple reasons, either um, confidentiality, potential violence, um, disclosure of more than just HIV status. There could be infidelity. There could be um, disclosure of um, sex work that wasn't known. So I think there's a lot of reasons that index clients may refuse, and the, the ones I gave you are those that have been documented in the Dominican Republic. And then I think finally, just a fear, a concern about the ramifications of this and how confidential indeed will this be. And I, I think it's also important to emphasize that it's not only the client's well-being that needs to be protected, but the partners whose information is being shared without their consent, um, it's critical to carefully strategize on how those partners will be reached, um, what is the appropriate time so that there's not an, um, a disclosure of their own uh, confidential information um, in, in that setting as well. 
Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. All right. Um, so we want to. Yes, hi, go ahead. Hi, this yeah. is um, Sandra here from um, the PAHO office in Barbados. Hi, Sandra. Can I just, can I just um, make an intervention? Sure, go ahead. Yes, I want to first thank the two present, um, presenters, um, Cheryl and the colleague from the Dominican Republic. I think those are two very excellent um, presentations. They were very concise, precise, and to the point. I just want to um, throw out here, and I think both, both presenters mentioned it, is that this is a concept that has been used in public health for a long time. And I also want to actually show throughout that, and I don't know how many people are online or can recall um, back in the early 2000s, um, Jamaica had an experience. Um, it was called partner notification. I can't remember the exact um, terminology where on the chart, they were providing training to all, well, they had a curriculum and providing training um, for the okay. index partner testing. Hello, can you hear me? We're hearing you. Go ahead, Sharon. Yes, for index partner um, testing, and I, you know, I think it's it's the same um, underlining concept. Some terminologies might be different, and I know countries in the region had were trained. Some countries were trained, and I know some countries has also adopted the protocol at the time that was developed. So th there may be a need to revisit why this did not work and, and was widespread in the region because it was for HIV. And, and also, and I do know the issue of legislation and the, how the legislation was interpreted in some of the countries um, had, some, um, had to do with the widespread implementation. So I'm just saying that to say that I think perhaps we need to look at um, what were some of the lessons got learned, look at the similarities with this program that was um, being implemented on the chart, look at the similarities and see how best we can build on that to advance forward so that we can strengthen the partner notification for, um, for HIV as well as for syphilis, because I, if I recall, that was also part of the underlining concept when this was being implemented in the early 2000s. So I just really want to actually share that information um, that the, the region had tried to implement this for HIV. And I think we should be, we should be able to um, build on that experience and see how we could ad advance in this new era. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that intervention, Sharon. And yes, there has been some amount of steps towards uh, having partner notification a part of how we respond to the HIV epidemic. Uh, I'm sorry that we did not get to answer all of your questions this afternoon, but we want to create an avenue that allows you to ask your questions post uh, the webinar. I'm hoping my presenters will avail themselves to assist. Um, but I, I just want to quickly remind us of what were the key things to take away. You will need a mix of both provider referral and voluntary partner referrals. Uh, a very good strategy that was introduced was a violence prevention strategy, as well as a data protection strategy. All these are going to become very, very important pieces as we seek to implement partner notification in our different uh, workspaces. So this brings to the end of our webinar today. As a reminder, you will receive a short evaluation survey, and we would love to hear your feedback on behalf of PANCAP, the director, Mr. Derek Springer, chair, and the knowledge management working group, we want to say thank you so much. Cheryl, Daniel, thank you so much for investing your time and your efforts into making this webinar a success. We thank, we're thankful for the partnership from the Pan American Health Organization. Thank you so much for making this. Tomorrow, we'll have another webinar. At the same time, we'll be looking at HIV self-testing and we encourage that you join us for that. Finally, uh, please feel free to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter and look out for the updated and redesigned website. Thank you so much for your participation, guys. Do take care.